on the first day of fall, well after the school year has began, Mark Few and the Gonzaga Bulldogs added another player to the 2023-24 roster in Serbian forward Pavel Stosic. What does it mean? Let's discuss. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use promo code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Lots to cover today on Locked on Zags. Asa Newell listed Gonzaga in his top four. We're going to discuss that and some other updates on the class of 2024, as well as Gonzaga's new coaching changes, including a promotion for Zach Norvell. But first, the longest offseason in Gonzaga basketball history continues. Folks, my birthday weekend, I turned 33 on September 23rd. My birthday weekend has historically been a time when I can do whatever I want to do. I can go out for the weekend, go celebrate. I went out to Bend, Oregon with some friends this weekend, typically without having to be too concerned about Gonzaga news breaking. It is well past the point where you're going to see transfer portal updates, past the point where you would expect to see new player updates. It is before craziness in the kennel, so any player updates about injuries or playing time or anything like that are typically still a few weeks away. However, this offseason has continued to be as long as possible. It's not a criticism. It is just a unique newness to the modern college basketball slate. Gonzaga has particularly had some wonkiness with Alex Tui leaving the program fairly late in the offseason. The addition of Marcus Adams Jr. not lasting very long. Of course, the medical retirement of Caden Perry. All of that led to situations where Gonzaga found themselves after the academic school year began with only 10 scholarships filled. Now they have 11. A post from RJ Barsh, Gonzaga's assistant coach, alongside Pavel Stosic, posted in his car, tagged with the Gonzaga location, indicated that Pavel has moved to the United States and is going to join Gonzaga for the 23-24 season. As I'm recording this right now, it is not updated on the roster, but it sounds like this is all the The T's are being dotted, or the I's are being dotted, the T's are being crossed, etc. Whatever needs to be done to get this done. Stosic had been playing with Anagon Olivar Zaragoza in the Spanish League. He was averaging nine points and 5.2 boards in 10 games with them. Uh, He also played for CB Penas Huesca, also in the Spanish League. He averaged three and a half points in 16 games with them. Beyond that, he also represented Serbia in the 2021 FIBA U18 games. He played for them in he played 20 minutes for game 20 minutes per game excuse me for them in five games they went four and one and lost to Spain was their only loss he averaged 6.6 points 4.2 boards and 1.4 assists frankly it's hard to find a lot more on Stosic at this point not a lot of data out there you can comb YouTube you're not going to find much you can comb his Twitter account you find a little bit more there but even still not all that much there's not a ton to go off right now a couple things that we do know is that he has gone through, he went through Real Madrid's youth system and he was frequently teammates with Baba Miller. Baba Miller plays for Florida State as an incoming sophomore, as an expected 2024 NBA draft candidate, had also previously been recruited by Gonzaga and also was, of course, recruited by Florida State when R.J. Barsh was there. So Barsh likely had familiarity with Stoshitz because they had both come up in that same league together because Barsh was busy recruiting Baba Miller. So it stands to reason that Gonzaga's interest in Miller, Barsh's interest in Miller having recruited him successfully to Florida State, likely meant that both parties were aware of, had an understanding of who Stosic was. Stoshitz, there was a quote in an article uh, that was translated from Serbian, and he basically said he he didn't expect to come to the United States. He got an opportunity that he couldn't pass up. Very excited to join a program like Gonzaga, et cetera, et cetera. So 
we kind of have to just go on the assumption that this is a player that fits a need for Gonzaga. And you can see the appeal with, again, we talked about Tui being out the door, Marcus Adams Jr. being the player expected to replace him. He was only uh, he was only committed to Gonzaga for a month before he decided to end up going to BYU. Of course, Caden Perry was also a six foot nine, you know, small ball five type player who is not going to be able to play anymore uh, because of a medical injury. So it's not surprising to a see Gonzaga do whatever they can to fill sp scholarship spots. We had 10 spots full. That's pretty, pretty low. Even for Gonzaga, they don't often fill all 13, but only having 10 is definitely not something we've seen from them all of that often. Uh, so for them to add another spot add a center add a player that the coaching staff was likely familiar with that RJ Barsh was likely familiar with. And of course for, for Stosic, Gonzaga already has a Serbian connection. Philip Petrusev came over from Serbia, played two great years at Gonzaga, obviously, you know, left early to go back home, was an MVP with his team Mega BMAX in Serbia. So if you're Stosic and you're watching, you know, your home country's basketball while you're a high schooler and you see Philip Petrusev be the legitimate best player in that league and you know, hey, that guy went to Gonzaga and then suddenly Gonzaga comes calling for you. It's not hard to see why that might be appealing for Gonzaga to continue to have a connection overseas. They, of course, have many connections in many different countries, but right now the Serbian pipeline feels pretty strong between Petrusev and now Stosic. Of course, the team already has Luka Krajinovic on the roster, who they added a few weeks ago. He comes over from Croatia. They also have Jun Sak Yo on the roster. He joined the team in January from South Korea. So we have three international players on the roster. The fear that Tommy Lloyd's departure was going to lead to Gonzaga not being able to recruit internationally has been proven to be unfounded in a significant way. Gonzaga's international recruiting is at an all-time high right now in terms of quantity of players. We will have to see how the quality of said players breaks out. Uh, all three of these guys are, of course, incoming freshmen. How much any of them plays right now is kind of up in the air. I will say that the likelihood of Stosic playing a significant role in year one is pretty slim. The likelihood of him playing a role at all might be fairly slim. He is literally just now getting to campus. Unless, you know, he's been here for a few weeks and Barsh just now posted that picture. I suppose that's possible while they're still, you know, getting all everything figured out. But Stosic wasn't here over the summer. He didn't work out with the team during summer workouts. He hasn't really been working out with the team up until very recently. There is likely a language barrier that may not, you know, that may be true of Krajinovic and Yo as well. But again, Yo has been here since January. Krajinovic has only been here for a few weeks longer than Stosic. But, and, and, and quite frankly, I'm not sure if Krajinovic is going to have a big role. He's maybe in that seven, eight, potentially nine spot in the, in the rotation, which as we know, the ninth spot in the rotation doesn't play all that significantly. So for Stosic, he is going to be, of course, behind Anton Watson, who's going to start at the power forward position, likely be Gonzaga's best or second best player. Graham E.K. is, is expected to start at the five. Uh, no reason at this point to indicate that he's not going to be the guy who starts at the five for Gonzaga. Ben Gregg is expected to be the third big, probably increase his role from last year where he played about 12 minutes per game. Gonzaga in the last couple of years has pretty staunchly played a three big rotation. So right now, ex I would expect those three to soak up the vast majority of the minutes at the four and the five. Braden Huff, coming off of a redshirt season, is probably the fourth big. It's very hard for me to imagine that Stosic comes in and soaks up minutes away from Braden Huff. If that were to happen, it could be because Stosic is, is excellent and, and better than anybody else that could have been available at that time and is a great find for Gonzaga. It also might mean something perhaps negative about Braden Huff if he wasn't able to secure that fourth big spot over a guy who joined the team in late September. But my guess is that Stosic is probably going to redshirt. There's not inside information here. This is not something the coaching staff has indicated that Stosic has indicated. In fact, his quotes in the newspaper said he hopes to try to make an impact on this team in year one, which is what you would expect any player to say in that moment. It could mean that Gonzaga didn't outright tell him they're going to redshirt him, which is reasonable. Most of the time you don't say that right away, but his ability to get up to speed in the offense, familiar with the system, familiar with, you know, playing college basketball in general in time to be a rotation player in year one feels unlikely to me. 
This is more than likely a move towards the future, adding a six foot nine forward who could help replace Anton Watson's production next season, depending, of course, what happens with EK and Greg and everybody else. You don't know what kind of roster changes could happen. And it's possible this is a move made in response to Asa Newell which is what I want to talk about in the second segment. Asa Newell, a top 15 prospect in the class of 2024. He has listed his top four, and it includes Gonzaga. And they are considered a very, very likely destination for Newell. But there is one school that is still considered the front runner. Is that going to cost Gonzaga a chance at a six foot nine stretch four in Newell? We're going to discuss that after a word from today's sponsor, Game Time. Life is always so busy, and honestly, the last thing that I really want to be stressed out about is trying to buy tickets to events. Thankfully, there's Game Time, which has killer deals on last-minute tickets for all the events I want to go to at the spur of the moment. And when choosing seats for events, I don't like having to worry about whether I'm going to have an obstructed view, whether the sun's going to be in my eyes, all of that stuff. However, Game Time has images of views from your seat so that you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. And forget having to plan months in advance. Game Time is the place for last minute ticket deals. They have deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. Plus, you can get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football games, basketball, baseball, as well as concerts, comedy, theater, and more. The Game Time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. So pick an event, use Game Time, and snag those tickets with stress free. Download the Game Time app right now, create an account, and use promo code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE, and you'll get $20 off your first purchase. Again, create an account and redeem code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE for $20 off your first ticket. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. Folks, want to thank all of you for making Locked On, Coll- Locked on Zags your first listen or watch of the day. Thankful to all of you who have subscribed on YouTube. We did cross the 2,000 subscriber mark, but folks... Why not get to 2,500? I think we can do it. At least, at least let's get to as many subscribers on YouTube as Drew Timmy had points in a Gonzaga uniform. I'm flying off the cuff here. I think it was like 2,237, something like that for Drew Timmy's total points. If you have not subscribed on YouTube, just go to youtube.com, search Locked on Zags, hit that big red subscribe button. It is very much appreciated. All right, folks, we're talking recruiting here in the second segment. We talked about a new freshman coming in in the class of 2023, joining the squad from Serbia and Pavel Stosic. Now I want to talk about Asa Newell because last week, I think it was Thursday evening, Asa Newell revealed his top four schools as a top 15 prospect in the class of 2024. Gonzaga was on the list alongside Georgia, Texas, and Alabama. Georgia is the school that stands out here. And I've said this in the past, And it's kind of a known thing in the recruiting circles. If a school stands out, usually because they are not maybe as successful recently from a basketball perspective, oftentimes there's a really compelling reason. And oftentimes that reason gives that school the advantage. A lot of people looked at Asa Newell's top four, saw Gonzaga, you know, top perennial top 15 team, top 10 team, you know, often a number one seed. They saw Texas, who was, a, you know, a really, really good team last year, has been a top 10 team for many years as well. Alabama, of course, a number one seed. And they saw Georgia and thought, well, why would he go to Georgia? That doesn't make any sense. Because he got family there. Because his brother goes there. Because he's from there. Georgia is considered the front runner right now, as I'm recording this on Tuesday morning. Now, all indications are that it's kind of down to Georgia and Gonzaga. That is what we're hearing. That is what we're seeing. That is the indication. It kind of makes sense. Gonzaga is also an outlier. Geographically, they are a major outlier in terms of, you know, not being an SEC school where Texas will be by the time Newell comes to school. All three of those schools are in the SEC. Gonzaga is not, not even close to the SEC. They're on the other side of the country in the West Coast Conference. Gonzaga stands out arguably even more than Georgia from an institutional perspective. So to me, reading the tea leaves, you see Gonzaga and Georgia and you think that's kind of what it is. Either he's going to stay home, either he's going to go to school with his family, with a coaching staff that's very familiar with him in his home state, in his home area, or he's going to do none of that. (laughs) And he's going to go all the way across the country. He's going to go to Spokane, Washington. He's going to play for Mark Few. He's going to play a beautiful role as a stretch for replacing Anton Watson. It feels to me like those are the two options. A little bit more on who Newell is, six foot nine forward. Again, he's from Montverde Academy in Florida is where he's, where he's attending school. He's from Georgia, but Montverde Academy is where the Nemhards went to school. 
It's where Philip Petrusev went to school. It is a school that Gonzaga has familiarity with. It is a school that Gonzaga has recruited out of successfully in the past. Newell is number 13 ranked player in the class of 2024 at 24-7 Sports. He is number eight in their composite rankings, meaning a lot of places have him top six, top five potentially in terms of his impact in that class. He's six foot nine, left-handed shooter. He spaces the floor really well. He's got elite athleticism. There's not a whole heck of a lot that Asa Newell doesn't do. He is a prototypical NBA stretch four caliber player. The modern power forward is kind of defined by what Asa Newell does. He can protect the rim. He can space the floor. He's a great lob threat and a rim runner. His combination of size and skill is really unmatched. And he's kind of, he's pretty raw. He hasn't played much at Montverde Academy. It's a school that plays a lot of guys, uh, not huge amounts of minutes. So we probably haven't seen the full breadth of what Asa Newell can be. But in an offense like Gonzaga's, where you're getting up and down the floor pass, where you're doing a lot of pick and roll side to side ball screen actions, where you can be a rim runner and a floor spacer. It really stands to reason that this is a place that would fit for him very well. Now, Alabama would fit as well in terms of his floor spacing abilities. I think Texas and Rodney Terry could do some good stuff with him, but it really sounds like it's going to be Gonzaga or Georgia. Georgia would certainly give him the ball a lot. He would be a primary scorer for them in a way that he might not be at Gonzaga. But again, I think this is going to come down to, do you want to go to the offense where you have a really great chance of thriving, of succeeding, of being a high-level draft pick, or do you want to stay home? Where you are also going to get opportunities to really showcase your skills. It's going to be an interesting battle. It's probably going to come out very soon. It's possible it's come out by the time you're listening to this, uh, as it sounds like Newell's going to make his decision shortly. But Gonzaga is very much in the mix right now. Also for the Zags, they are still in the mix in the Zoom Diallo sweepstakes, which has been a slow, slow burn for the teams interested in Zoom Diallo. He is the number 19 ranked prospect in the class of 20 in the class of 2024 at 24-7 Sports, number 21 in their composite rankings, borderline four, five-star point guard, six foot four guard. He's from Tacoma, Washington. He went to Curtis High School before transferring to Prolific Prep High School in Napa, California, which is a school for the premier basketball players in the country. Him transferring down to California isn't something I'm overly concerned about in terms of Gonzaga's chances of landing him. But it has been a really long time. His top five has been out for a while. Gonzaga, Arizona, USC, Kansas, and Washington. Two schools in his home state. Gonzaga and Arizona, of course, two schools with those high octane uh, pick and roll heavy offenses, which he would certainly thrive in. USC is always hard to ignore because of the money that you get there, the prestige you get there from going to USC. And Andy Enfield has been recruiting really hard uh, on on the trail the last couple of years. And then of course, Kansas never want to rule out Kansas uh, as a player uh, coming out of high school. So that makes sense that they're there as well. Zoom Diallo and Asa Newell are kind of Gonzaga's only known targets in the class of 2024. And I say known targets for a couple of reasons. One, we just don't know that Gonzaga isn't heavily recruiting other players whether they're kind of doing it behind the scenes, whether those players haven't really made any announcements about their indications yet, whether Gonzaga has some guys kind of on the back burner that they're planning to pursue if things fall through with Newell and Zoom. But the other part of this, Gonzaga doesn't necessarily have a lot of open spots that they know of coming into the next year. Of course, they only have 11 scholarship players right now, so they do know that they have some spots. But Gonzaga's team is really young. The only player who will not be on this team next year, guaranteed, is Anton Watson. That is it. Ryan Nemhard can return. Nolan Hickman can return. Steel Venters can return. Graham Ike can return. Ben Gregg can return. Everybody else is freshman. Braden Huff, of course, a redshirt freshman, but Dusty Stromer's a freshman. Luka Krajnovic is a freshman. Jun Sakyo is considered a freshman. Pavel Stoshich is a freshman. This is a young, young team. And trying to pursue a bunch of players in the class of 2024 doesn't make sense because Gonzaga doesn't necessarily know what they're going to have, what is going to be available. In my mind, recruiting top 15 talent, guys like Newell and Zoom who would start right away for this team, who would be super high impact players immediately, that makes sense because you're going to make adjustments. If those guys come to campus, you'll figure the rest out. If everybody else stays, then you'll just, you'll figure it out. Somebody probably will choose to leave at that point because they'll realize they're not going to have as much playing time. But other than that, recruiting top 60 freshmen, top 75 freshmen doesn't make a lot of sense. 
because you don't know what spots you're going to have open. And if you do end up having spots open, if guys do transfer, if guys do declare early for the draft, then you just fill it with transfers. Gonzaga hasn't struggled to fill those spots with transfer additions. So to me, trying to load up on a bunch of freshmen in a future class when your entire team is eligible to come back minus one player doesn't make a lot of sense. Zoom and Asa make a ton of sense. It would be incredible for the Zags to land either of them. It would be even more incredible if they landed both of them. The future would be insanely bright in Spokane in 2024 if they landed Zoom and Asa. But if they don't land either of them, don't be surprised if they don't get too heavily involved in anybody else in the class of 2024. They might be willing to fill whatever roster spots need to be filled via the transfer portal. And frankly, I don't blame them. I don't blame them. If you can't get elite freshmen, elite freshmen at this point, go with the transfer portal. It just seems like a better, safer, more secure way to build a roster. And Mark Few and the Zags have done a dang good job of that in the last 20 years. We're going to close out today's show discussing Zach Norvell's promotion and a new role for Jorge Sands and what it means for the Zags in light of the NCAA's new rules. All that coming up after a word from today's sponsor, DoorDash. Do you need fresh groceries for the week, but you don't have time to go to the store? Try grocery delivery from DoorDash. You'll get everything you want whenever you want it, delivered when you need it, right to your door. Look, you've trusted DoorDash to deliver your restaurant favorites, and now you can get grocery delivery that actually delivers too. With thousands of grocery stores to choose from, you'll find the best in your neighborhood and be boosting your local economy with each and every order. You'll get exactly what you ordered or we will make it right. So sit back and enjoy quality groceries just like you picked them yourself. And if you want even more value, you can save on all of your grocery and restaurant favorites with a $0 delivery fee on all eligible orders with a DoorPash membership. With easy substitutions right in the app and best in class customer support, DoorDash delivers groceries exactly how you want them. Get 50% off your first DoorDash order up to a $20 value when you use code Locked On College at checkout. This is a limited time offer and terms do apply. But that's 50% off up to $20 and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter the promo code Locked On College. Code Locked On College, 50% off your first order with DoorDash. All right, folks, segment three here, still Andy Patton, still. Locked on Zags, busy Tuesday episode here, of course. Go out of town for a couple days on vacation in late September, not expecting that there's going to be massive recruiting news, a new player joining the roster, and some coaching changes. All that happening in a couple days span. That is the life of a daily Gonzaga basketball podcaster, for the record. Wouldn't trade it for anything, but of course, wasn't too surprised to see that stuff go down while I was out of town. Want to close out the show here talking about Gonzaga's coaching changes. And the reasoning for this is that the NCAA has a new rule that they voted on in January, but it went into effect July 1st. And effectively, the new rule eliminates volunteer coaches across all Division I sports, which is an objectively very good thing without getting into too much of a uh, American labor dispute conversation. People should get compensated for the work that they do and volunteer jobs and internships should be, we're seeing them gradually go away. And in sports, it's a pretty uh, pervasive issue. So now teams have more coaching, coaching positions that they can pay. They don't have volunteer coaches. And for Gonzaga, the staff went from three to five, and they filled those spots. They, of course, already had Brian Michelson, who's been the associate head coach for a few years now. They had Stephen Gentry. They have RJ Barsh. All three of those guys in the staff out recruiting, out doing their jobs. But the, staff, the NCAA rules allowed them to add two more full-time paid staff members as coaches those coaches are not allowed to recruit off campus, I should say. They can't really prevent you from helping recruit players who are already on campus. But the two new players, the two new staff members, Gonzaga didn't go out and hire new people. They just promoted from within the system. Zach Norvell is now elevated to an assistant coach after spending the last two years as a graduate assistant. Meanwhile, Jorge Sanz, who has been with the program for five years as director of basketball operations, he is getting promoted as well. He is still keeping his director of basketball ops position. He is still the team's Dobo. That is code for director of basketball ops. Uh, he's still doing that, but he has also been elevated to assistant coach, giving him a, a bit of a title bump, a bit of a, a role change as well. Uh, likely something that the staff has been wanting to do for him for a while as somebody who has been a really big part of the program. So good to see those two guys get those opportunities. Of course, Norvell is the big notable one here because when he first joined the team as a graduate assistant, it was a little unclear if he was 
planning to try to continue his professional basketball playing career. This move seems to indicate that that is something that is not on the table for him. Norvell started at Gonzaga from 2017 to 2019. He played briefly in the NBA and in the G League. All WCC first teamer in 2018-19. He was a newcomer of the year in 2017-18. Scored over 1,000 career points. A fantastic player for Gonzaga in his couple years with the program. His quote in the article at the Spokesman Review discussing this new position, he said, Quote, I'm, thank- I'm blessed and thankful for, the op- for this opportunity to continue to build and grow our culture and program at the same time learning from our coaching staff and help, I- and help impact winning as much as possible. I want to say one thing on Zach Norvell because I've talked about this a handful of times on the podcast. is frequently discussed in mailbag questions when people ask about players who made decisions to leave early and, and, and Norvell seems to come up as kind of the, the player that Gonzaga fans most believe made a mistake in leaving early. I think it's funny because there are so many other programs that have just tons and tons of players who leave early for Gonzaga. The list of players who have left early is fairly minimal. And yet this, the fan base still gets real up in arms when a few guys do it. And Zach Mort- Norvell is kind of somebody that I think the fan base really likes to point out that they think it was a mistake as if it's some kind of cautionary tale to opposing uh, to future players. But I have the opposite take. Zach Norvell getting hurt. He had recent knee surgery. He dealt with knee injuries throughout his brief professional basketball playing career. To me, the fact that Zach Norvell got hurt is proof that he actually made the right decision. Is it possible that Zach Norvell returning to college for another season would have elevated his game, elevated his stock to get drafted uh, and potentially led to him playing more than 10 games in the NBA? Yes. Is it also possible that he would have also gotten injured and then never played in the NBA? Yes. Zach Norville made a decision that ultimately didn't work out as he had hoped, certainly, but the decision led to him playing 10 games in the NBA. It led to him playing two seasons in the G League where he got compensated as a G League basketball player. It has led to a situation now where he's an assistant coach for the basketball program. I don't think that it's hard to, it's, it's hard to, to find that overly critical. Of course, he wanted to play more NBA games. Zach Norvell was also an undersized shooting guard who didn't play the point guard position. That is the most common archetype basketball player that exists. Rasir Bolton didn't sniff the NBA. Malachi Smith maybe will get some run uh, briefly, perhaps. My gut tells me he's probably not going to be an NBA player more than maybe a 10-day contract if a team gets desperate. Not saying that those guys are better than Zach Norvell necessarily, but being a six foot four guard who doesn't play point guard, borderline doesn't work in the modern NBA. I'm not sure Zach Norvell staying for another year would have led to that. And if his knee already had some, some issues that caused him to get injured, and you don't know, maybe it wouldn't have happened. To me, I don't think you can blame a guy for making that decision, trying to go out as soon as you can. He didn't have NIL. It wasn't an opportunity for him. It wasn't something he could have earned money in school. I don't know his family situation, but some guys just want to get out and get, get paid as soon as they possibly can. You only got a finite amount of time to, to, to capitalize on that. To answer the actual question as I get it in mailbag, it, in terms of players who made the the – who, who, who made the, the worst decision, I guess we'll put it that way. I often say Elias Harris because Elias Harris was projected by many to be a first round pick after his freshman year at Gonzaga. He returned, played three more years, didn't get worse, but didn't really get better. And instead of being a 19 year old, six foot eight forward with upside coming out of the draft, he became a 22 year old forward with less perceived upside. Signed with the Los Angeles Lakers. I think he might've appeared in the game, but I'm not sure. And that was it. Elias Harris coming out after his freshman year probably gets a much bigger chance in the NBA because he gets drafted. Teams are invested financially. So to me, Elias Harris's decision to stay at Gonzaga for three more years was worse than Zach Norvell's decision, in my opinion. I know people sometimes disagree with that, but I wanted to lay that out because this feels like an opportunity to get a chance to talk about Zach in a way we don't often get to. Talking about Jorge Sanz as well, uh, his quote in that same article, he says, I'm extremely grateful for the level of trust Coach Few has placed on me and the opportunity to further assist the program in this new role. I look forward to helping our, coach, our, helping our student athletes fulfill their highest potential on and off the court. Sanz is a guy who is a U18. He was on the U18 coaching staff in Spain this summer. Uh, he's been around the block. He's, he's at Florida Atlantic for eight years before he came to Gonzaga. He was a Dobo there. He was an assistant coach there, also a video coordinator. Now he's in his sixth, entering his sixth year at Gonzaga, gets that bump to assistant coach, a really valuable guy to have around. Adding Sanz and, and Norvell in these roles is extremely valuable, extremely cool for Gonzaga to get the opportunity to do this. And I'm excited 
that the NCAA has changed the rules to allow this to happen and that Gonzaga is taking advantage because having these two guys in elevated roles around the program is objectively a very good thing for the Bulldogs in the 23-24 season. That's going to wrap us up here today on the Locked On Zags podcast. Thank you so much for making the show your first listen or your first watch of the day. we got more fun stuff coming later this week. We're going to talk a little bit more Pac-12 Mountain West merger, what that could mean for the Zags in light of some new information between those two conferences, all coming up in the later this week right here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Thanks so much for listening, and until next time, as always, go Zags.